Firstly, this is going to be a long stream and there will be, and there's a fucking fly in my face. That's not one of the things to mention, but anyway, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to JCMS, the guy who runs Meta Monday and who puts together these stats every single week. A lot of hard work goes into this, guys. He does all the hard work and all I do is add my shitty opinion into it. So if you want to support him, he does have a Patreon. So please, please consider, uh, go if you like this kind of meta analysis um, and you like to go through the stats in your own time and everything, you like what uh, this, this, uh, this does for our community, uh, you know, please say, you know, show your appreciation for JCMS. And if you can, uh, please consider uh, checking out the Patreon and, uh, and you know, throwing support behind it. So the Adept of the Gattacus coming in stone cold last with... And the eye watering. Ugh. That that might be the lowest that we have seen since the start of 10th edition. Maybe went a little lower at the very beginning when everyone was figuring things out, but that that's pretty bad. And then it gets even worse when you when you realize that that 28% win rate is being propped up because there was only three people that played Admech this week. Now, that might not sound like a lot, and it isn't. And I did say it was a quiet week, and it is a quiet week. We've got about half the numbers that we would normally have. So clearly, people were spending time with their families over Easter. Even at the busiest of times, they don't tend to get double... They barely get double digits of players. Out of these three players, one guy managed to win three games and lose three games, getting a 50% win rate. And he was using the, the cohort cybernetic, which I don't think I've seen anyone, anyone run. The other two people uh, were running um, Rad Zone Core, and they combined couldn't get as many wins as the one guy on his own. While this is an incredibly small sample size, there is actually some important titbits of information. The first one being that the small sample size isn't really changing. Despite the fact we've seen that Admec have the potential we're not seeing people jump on the faction. We're also seeing with this as well, those people that have done very, very well with Admech have gone for the Skatari cohort. That seems to be the way they're going. And the general uh, prevailing, uh, this, this very good place, this, this, this powerful place out that Admech have seems to lead heavily into hordes of, of Skatari and the, and the chicken walk guys. Now, the big issue with that is real-life cost. I, sp I spoke about a few months ago, at the beginning of 10th edition, and I spoke about this, in, I spoke about this in, in 9th edition as well, about how GW has, I think, crossed the line, where the prices are starting to become uh, too much, or, and, and people are getting priced out. And it's getting to a point now where it doesn't matter how good you make a faction, or you know, or, or how viable a faction's build can be, certain factions are being priced out, and uh, and I think Admech are a, a great example of that. And a big problem with things like like Admech, they are a relatively niche faction, and they've only been around, only been around in in the, as a full full standalone faction with 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 everything in one place since 8th edition so there isn't a um so with them being quite niche and there's never been in a starter box or anything like that so uh, yes they did have admech and skatari but they were separate factions in 7th edition so from their inception as a standalone faction together 8th edition they've always been very niche though and the issue is that there's not a good secondhand market for them Moving on, we then have the Dark Angels. Dark Angels started off very strong and over the last three weeks have progressively gone. And now they're kind of kind of in the shitter. Now, there are only nine players this week, which, like I said, it's a quiet week. That's always a, a fact you can take into account. They've only got a 36% win rate, but look at look be look beyond the 36. Because one person won an event. One person won an event. And if you look in here, Ironstorm Spearhead 
Two players won six out of 11 games. 55% win rate. Very healthy. Gladius Task Force. We've seen this do all right with uh, Dark Angels. Well, we've seen actually Gladius Task Force do fine with, with various different chapters. Managed to get 50% win rate. This is where it's gone fucky. The Vanguard Spearhead had two players who only managed to win two games between them. So they only had a 25% win rate. And then you had the Inner Circle Task Force, which, off the top of my head, has been consistently dog shit. Every week that has gone by, we have seen people turn up with their Inner Circle Task Force. And every week it seems to be yielding worse and worse results. Unfortunately, it seems like Dark Angels players were under the illusion that they should be playing their army as Dark Angels and not strapping Azrael to the to the the bumper, the ball bars uh, of, of, the, of the Gladiator Lancer. Uh, <laughs> Essentially, it's Dark Angels are uh, they win by playing Ironstorm Spearhead and um, basically taking Azrael because Azrael uh, gives you that extra CP and also he's got some other tricks with sleeve. It is and it isn't as bad as it looks. It's as bad as it looks because if you want to play them fluffy, you shut out of luck. But it isn't as bad as it looks because you do actually have viable uh, and sev several viable tournament win winning strategies, but you're not playing Dark Angels, you're playing Green Marine. And, you, and that's something that Dark Angels players will have to uh, emotionally square away with themselves and decide what is more important to me, playing my Dark Angels Dark Angels or just winning winning games. And um, in a competitive sense, technically the latter one is better. But human beings, we're, an emo we're emotional creatures. Sometimes the obvious logical route is not always the route we want to go down. Imperial Knights are also a faction that week in week out we've seen falling they had a little bit of a, res of a resurgence when uh, when their big knight points went uh, down and we saw people starting to run the big knights and maybe this is just an off week maybe and i'm fully willing to accept that but when you've got 13 players which is not bad for this for this for this quiet weekend and between them, they're only winning 26 out of 69 nice games. And no one is going... It's not like Dark Angels where we've got, you know, a couple of people that are threatening to do well, one person that's gone all the distance. But out of all these players, no one managed to do well. It kind of seemed... No one, no one even went 4-1, and one, which means every single player went 3-2 and two or worse. Like I said, quite a week. We may see that it go up. My suspicion is we bring anti-tanks, sir. Imperial Knights have a bit of a resurgence, but inevitably people go, oh, Knights are on the up and up again. I'll bang a few more Lazcans in my army. I'll bang an extra Gladiator from my army. I'll take a Demartian Cannon over a Battle Cannon, something like that. And so people are already... Uh, knights, are, knights are having a bit of a weird one where they should be very, very good because this is an, this is an addition of vehicles and monsters, and they are literally the vehicle faction. The problem is, because everyone knows it's that kind of addition, they're gearing up with all the fucking anti-tank. And so what we're finding is you still need tanks to be good, but you need other bits as well. And that primary game and that secondary game. That's those last two, something that Knights, even with good OC and a lot of their models, struggle with. Moving up out of the bottom three, we have a surprise here, uh, and that is World Eaters. Uh, so World Eaters coming in with, with decent player numbers for this relatively quiet week. We only had about uh, 362 players, considering last week we had 900, the week before we had like 700. So it's a quiet week, but there's still some things we can learn from it. Uh, World Eaters, 15 players is, is good for this week. Uh, 33 wins, 84 uh out of 84 games, no one going the distance and only a 39% win rate. This is at odds with what we've seen World Eaters achieving in recent weeks. However, I would caution you all from just dismissing this as an anomaly. 
This may be an early indicator of an issue world eaters are going to face. That issue is the resurgence of the custodies. Whilst the custodies are in ascendancy, the world eaters generally tend to start struggling. And we've seen a few weeks of custodies getting more and more relevant on the tabletop, more and more prevalent in the tournament scene. And so we very well may be seeing the early stages of the world, the, the inevitable world eater collapse. It's not a permanent state of affairs at all because I mean, we, we know the meta is, is always shifting. And we also know that, you know, it's not just custodians out there. But if they if custodians are begin, becoming very dominant, it's it would not surprise me if we start to see a bit of a decline. And this quiet week gives us a bit of a a glance, a bit of a, a, a premonition of what the average world eater experience may become in the future. Next we've got Death Watch. Is, is is there life back in the faction? Maybe. Uh, my suspicion is that it's just a bit a bit of a, a random muscle spasm in the uh, in the twitching corpse that is a Death Watch faction. Uh, three players. Uh, we know what it's like when your faction's got very low player numbers. It can lead to some weird results where one person basically in their local GT, which only had about 12, 12 people in it, manages to fucking smash it and go like four and one and it boosts the overall power of the faction. Three players winning seven out of 17 games, uh, managing to get a 41% win rate. But my suspicion here is that it is suffering from low player number uh, and anomalous results. What we need to see from Death Watch, I almost don't care about this figure. In fact, I don't care about any of these figures. This is the only figure I care about with Death Watch. And they have been single digits for a while now. Like, I think since pretty much 2024 started, they've been uh, single digits. Uh, and let's be clear here, your good anomalous result is still like 41%, which is frankly terrible. It's not it's not terrible, terrible, but it's... it's. You know how like when Admech only had three players, but their good anomalous result was 83% win rate? That's what we call a good anomalous result. When your good anomalous result is 41%, so yeah, Death Watch, still a dead faction. This is the number, and it's just not going up. Now, it's not likely to go up, obviously, in a in a quiet week, but uh, it's just not changing no matter what. Likewise, in a similar vein to uh, World Eaters, we have the Orcs. Now, Orcs seem to have stabilized this week. They were in a bit of a free fall. Good player numbers, 19. Actually, one of the most played factions, the most played faction we've seen so far, uh, with numbers comparable to um, like things like the Guard and probably like in the top sort of five for played factions. So, so Orcs put, coming out with good numbers and winning 44 out of 104 games, giving them a 42% win rate, which is good, which is okay. Okay, the problem with the uh, the problem with Orcs has been that they've been in free fall for like, for like two or three, four, four weeks now. Um, them having about a 42% win is a good week for them. Uh, the issue that Orcs face at the moment is it's, it's kind of similar to what World Eaters are facing. Uh, whenever we see Custodes rise, Orcs begin to fall because they really do rely upon uh, combat. And if you're facing into Custodes who can strike first, uh, and they have the pay CP for it, but they can strike first. They also are a bit of a horde army. They struggle in like those one-on-one -on -one fights. It just, yeah, it's it's tricky. I think orcs. The the, the 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 whilst the free fall seems to have stopped. My concern here is this number. No one with orcs went four and one better. Everyone went three and two, and it seems like. I can't remember the last time we had an Orc tournament winner. So what I'm the impression I'm getting from Orcs is that they're struggling. You go to a tournament, even if you're a good player, kind of expect to go two and three, three and two. But Orcs are not a tournament winning faction. It will be interesting to see what Orcs can do 
re, re, re turn, the, turn the franchise around. They need to start memeing and try and get all the weird and wacky shit. And uh, maybe they'll unlock some new secrets and they'll come back better than ever. But right now, Orcs, if they can stabilize around 42%, that's good. But then when they need to start, they can stop in the free fall. Stopping the bleeding is good. But then we need to start fighting back. So it looks like Magnus is getting tired of carrying the entire faction on his shoulders. So 17 players, 39 wins out of 91 games. 43% does seem kind of low. We did have one player that was able to go uh, four and one or better. So I mentioned this last week, but I'll, I'll mention it here again because I think it'll be quite uh, interesting to some people. And I don't know exactly how the mechanics of this work, but apparently there is a, a trick you can do with a thousand suns where you can like move a model like multiple times in a turn. It's like as long as the enemy can't see it or it can't see the enemy. It's it, I don't know if the cabal points are still a thing, but they can like do like a, a little a little warp jump or something and so what they do is they move from terrain piece to terrain piece until they get line of sight onto the enemy they like spend a few points get the enemy and then they can use a strategy which basically allows magnus to shoot indirectly from that model's line of sight and magnus is just a shooting beast so basically thousand suns are using Magnus to blast people off the table. Magnus is apparently like the Mutilex Vortex Beast is quite good at it as well. So be aware of that trick. If you see, if you hide everything, don't expect all of it to uh, be hidden. Leagues of Votan. Uh, yeah, they're sort of bimbling around, doing what they do. Not much change in Leagues of Votan. If they get to face Necrons, they're very, very happy. If they don't face Necrons, they don't do quite as well. Uh, they're they're anti-meta. 15 wins from 34 games with a 44% win rate with one player going all the way but no one winning the tournament. That's really where I feel Leagues of Votan are right now. They're a good faction. Their army rule is actually very powerful and their shooting is into their judged units is blisteringly effective. But they don't quite have what it takes to win a tournament. There's all, they're always going to encounter something at a GT over five rounds. There's always going to be something they encounter which has it all. And I would say Votan have got two out of three. What they have is good rules. What they also have is good points. What they don't have is good variety. It's good depth. And so they have a very viable build. But that build isn't, it, it, it's not quite good enough to win a tournament. And it, and if you don't go for that build, then you just don't do as well. So yeah, Votan are in a very interesting position right now where they're a solid 3-2, and 4-1 and one faction. But outside of exceptions to the prove the rule, I don't see them starting to dominate. Uh, they might win a tournament here. I'm not saying they can't win a tournament, but I don't see them as super major winning. And I could be wrong. I, I happily eat my words if, I, if, if they win more next week. They're, they're, they're just a little limited at the moment. Uh, and they've got m nearly everything, but not quite everything. Chaos Space Marines, uh, on the other hand, are just in a bad spot. Now, you might think that that Space Marines, you know, they're, they're higher on the list here than Votan. So surely, and they've got more players and they won more games. And no, the big problem with Chaos Space Marines is even though they won 30, even though they had 13 players, and won 30 out of 68 games. They had a 44% win rate. They had no one go 4-1. and one, And they had no one win an event. So in my mind, I would actually rank Votan as higher than Chaos Space Marines. The reason for that is it's been a long time since we've seen any significant numbers in these columns. I think Chaos Space Marines are a faction which are 2-3, and 3-2. Three, three and two. I don't think that they have what it, I, th I think if you take Care Space tournament, you'll probably if you go to a GT with Care Space, you'll probably lose two of the games. The average Joe on the street will lose two of the games, and uh, the best players might be able to go four and one. But we're talking about the best of the best. So yeah, so the, the issue with Space Marines, and I'm only and I'm, I'm not looking at this from a space from a chaos perspective. I'm looking at this from their opponent's perspective. Every single chaos player 
that I see, and I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again, takes that fucking Abaddon Gigablob, and I think it's terrible. It's 700 smegging points. 700 points with 10 Terminators in a character. I'm sorry, but there is... I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but let me off. That's like two Shadow Swords. It's like three Rogal Dawns. Nearly. Like I said, I'm exaggerating slightly. I think the three Rogal Dawns would fucking butcher it. For the love of God, stop taking the Abaddon Brick. Please. I know you think it's your best unit right now. It's taking up over a third of your list. And frankly, it's not that hard to kill. And it's not that hard to neutralize. And it doesn't hold it doesn't hold objective. You, you're like, oh, but I, I think it I think it could hold the mid-ground. It can't hold the mid-ground. I could stop you from holding that middle ball objective with a 55-point unit of catch chance. Maybe two, okay, because you're gonna overwatch the first one. But I literally put take catch chance on that objective. It's mine now. You have 10 OC. So you can't hold ground against because you haven't got the OC. You can't survive because you're not that tough. And, you have, and you're basically wielding fucking bolters. And this is the better of tanks and vehicles. So you're not winning any firefights. Okay? Just not the way to go. We need to see. I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe this is an indictment. But I, I, I honestly feel like every, every Chaos player that I come across is running the same thing. And I honestly feel like every Orc player is running the same thing. And I, and I can't help but see two trends there. Two trends where we've got good player numbers, but a middling win rate every single time. Same list every single time, and no one going the distance. I think it's time to go back to the drawing board and start figuring shit out. Because it's not whatever... Your staples are no longer your staples. Drakari, uh, for the second week in a row, have had no one running real space raiders. So it turns out that Drakari were absolutely fine. It's just their army rules were utterly trash sky splinter assault is now the way to play and what i find incredible about this is we've got some good player numbers here and yet we're not and even though Dakari have two uh detachments to choose from we're not seeing anyone running real space raiders and i think the reason for that is what, what i find what i find staggering about that is there's no like new players it's like there's like or if there is new players even they know to avoid the real space raiders I think my, my my take from this group from this is that whether it's new players or veteran players, the knowledge has filtered down and has disseminated uh, into the community it, via via osmosis. It has passed the blood brain barrier, and I'm probably using all sorts of terms wrong here. And uh, whether all Drukari players now know it's it's sky splinter or death, which is cool to see. Speaking of which, uh, they've got 14 players, very healthy numbers for a quiet week. 34 out of 76 uh, games won, and one person going the distance, and that person winning a tournament. Every week, the results are getting better and better. The numbers are looking good. I would, I would say that Dark Elder are certainly RTT winning. They're certainly GT winning. We have, they have, they have proven that now. What we need to find out is, are they super major? Are they major and super major winning? Um, speaking of the big leagues. Oh, ho, 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 ho. This, is, this is very spicy. Okay. Get the hype train rolling, boys. Because this is deceptively good. The, the Imperial Guard are fucking purging. And they are purging good. We've had a very... Like I said, we've had a deceptively good week this week, okay? Firstly, look at them player numbers. Bear in mind, you've heard me say this, it wasn't the busiest of weeks. That's more numbers than Eldar. That's more numbers than Space Marines. That's more numbers than Chaos Knights. That's, that's as many numbers as Death Guard, who are a very popular faction. Uh, in fact, the only people that had more... We were the third most played faction? Yes. So we were, we've got very, very strong player numbers. We've also won a respect... We've also got a high number of just raw wins. Just 50 fucking wins. 
That's, that, that's 50 games that were won. I know that sounds like obvious, like more you're just saying the same words in different orders, but it shows that there's a lot of games you can you can win games with 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 guard now. Consistently you can win games. 110 games played, giving us a 45% win rate. Now some people might be saying, Mordian, why are you getting your knickers all sticky over a 45% win rate? That seems remarkably middling. That's not what's getting me excited. The number of players is getting me very, very excited, but this is the number which is making me go from six to midnight. Five players and five and oh. I think that makes us the third most successful faction this week. So, 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 guard, you know, depending on how you look at it, what angle you look at it, what statistics you look at, guard with the third most successful faction this week <laughs> maybe now we didn't win any tournaments but uh but look at that we've got guards popping up on fucking leaderboards popping up in top cuts left right and center we're a real solid faction boys and uh it's great to see people uh great to see people are coming over to the faction i I love it when we start seeing guard player numbers go up. I always say the more the merrier. All is welcome in his Imperial Guard. And it's great to see so many people going uh, going very strong with them. A shame we didn't get any tournament wins, but there were only seven events. So there were only seven events. And out of those seven, we got five top placings. Not top, 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 but five very good showings. So yes, guard is looking very strong. And... Uh, it's looking like we are becoming a dominant faction. Now, what do I mean by a dominant faction? A little bit of a dominant faction. So when you go, when you know, when you go to a tournament, you're like, okay, I need what they are. You always say to yourself, you can't plan for like everything. But you can plan to like uh, across certain faction. You're like, okay, I know I'm going to come across custodies. What do custodies like to do? Sit in the middle of the board with fixed objectives. Okay, how do I counter that? Okay, I know I'm going to come across Eldar. What do Eldar like to do? They like to zip around and they're going to hit me hard, but I need to be... A, they're going to hit me hard. Okay, so what I need is redundancy. So, boys, become the meta. Embrace the guard! Yes! <laughs> uh, so, it's, yeah, so very, it's a very, very good week for guard. A much, much better week than this 45% would imply. Um, if if you were to twist my arm and, and ask me why I think we've only got a 45% win rate when 25% of our players went 4-0, um, we're getting a lot of new blood jumping onto the faction. It'll be interesting to see how many of those people stick with it, if they can grind through their first 5-10 games, start getting a feel for the faction. When there's no, when you know when we're in a dominant position, uh, we always have a high, like this number, and then a relatively weirdly low this number. Um, so yeah, so it's definitely one of those things where guard are very powerful right now. You can build them to be very dominant. They've got multiple dominant builds, uh, but with a lot of new blood coming in, you're going to have old guard players dusting off their models, and they're not being quite tuned in the right way for tenth. So they're going to be struggling. And you're going to have people that are jumping on even with good lists, but they haven't got those practice games under their belt yet. All right. So we've got Eldar. My, my, my. How turntables. 18 players means that we actually had more players than the Eldar this week. We got more raw wins than they did. And sure, uh, they had less games. And technically, they had a 46% win rate. But no Eldar players. Not one. Zilch. Zero. Nada. Finito. Nothing. Not a single one of the pointy knife-eared bastards went 4-1 and one or better. That means every single one of these 18 Eldar players went three and two or worse. The line has ended. Flee for your lives. Will they fall lower? On average, I don't think so. Will they go higher? On average, I don't think so. And they are where they are. And their position in the meta will shift 
not on their merits, but on the factions around them. Like, if other factions start doing worse, they might creep up again. If other factions start doing better, they might go down again. But their relative position relative power is 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 stable. Their, sorry, their internal power and internal position is stable. Their relative position is now in flux. This is the turn up for the bookies. Fuck me. I can't. I don't think I've seen Space Marines above Eldar since the beginning of 10th edition. They're basically on the same level. 46%, 46%. This just means that this is 46 point something. So this is probably this, this is this is 46.4. And this is 46.3 and below. Okay. And uh, basically Marines and Elder are actually on the same level. A couple of mad lads taking Stormlands didn't do so good. But actually we've got some very, uh, very mixed things going on here. It is looking like Marines are not Iron Storm be all and end all. You've got four players taking Vanguard, managing to get a 55% win rate and even one player going the distance. You've got Iron Storm, similar number of players going 48%. And and this is one that we've been that's been cropping up a while now. Uh week in, week out, we are seeing Firestorm Assault Force do something. Now it seems to hover around 45%-ish. Every week we are seeing people take Firestorm and every week those people are not getting their shit pushed in. They didn't get four and one, so the best it is three and two. But uh, we're not seeing them getting their shit pushed in. Firestorm seems to have had a bit of a lease on life, which is cool. It makes sense. Maneuverability is... Uh, movement wins games and, it is, and it is the, it's very much the movement one. Really one to watch. Holy, I like it. Yeah, a bit of... I agree, Nick Sander. It's nice to see some diversity in the Marines. It's not just fucking Iron Storm, fucking Iron Storm over and over again. Chaos Knights. Same shit, different week. Good player numbers. Good wins. Uh, uh, you know, decent win rate, 47%. So they had 15 players, 40 games out of 86, won. 47% win rate. And one player going the distance. It's crazy. When 10th edition started... Everyone said that Chaos Knights were dog shit and that Imperial Knights were best. And then uh, oh, then the, the tables have turned and uh, the franchises have swapped around. And now it looks now Imperial Knights are consistently a bit. <clears throat> and Chaos Knights are consistently doing quite well. Considering the day sheets are almost fucking identical, it, must, it comes down to army rules. Imperial Knights at the beginning of the edition had very, very strong army rules because everyone was cheating. It, what rules are written, it worked. GW just FAQ'd it. And uh, basically, everyone has jumped over to the Chaos Knights now. It's just War Dog spam. Exactly. Captured it. Index Brigand is a good faction. Yeah. The difference between Chaos Knights and Imperial Knights is Chaos Knights hit on twos. So if you are one of the... Their, their knights are more specialized. So their choppy knights only chop. And their shooty knights only shoot. Whereas in Imperial Knights, you've got shooty knights... And then you've got shooty knights with a little bit of choppy. So because of this, the chaos knights, their baby knights hit on twos. But the choppy ones only hit on twos in choppy. And the shooty knights only hit, hit on twos in shooty. Imagine if you get 150 point Lehman Russes that hit on twos. I think uh, I think we'd be doing you know quite well with that, wouldn't we? <laughs> so that's basically it. Imagine an armored imagine an armored company that's got good OC. That can hit on twos, and it also can do it in combat as well. Tyranids, bit of a resurgence, a little bit. Of, well, we a bit of a weird one. The Tyranids, that's it. I think there might be something. This is a slightly anomalous result. We've got twelve players who won thirty out of sixty-three games with two people going the distance, and uh, overall a forty-eight percent win rate with a tournament win. My God, sir. The Tyranids, I think, have won their first tournament of 2024. This is one event. Yes, it was only a 22-player GT. And yes, they went 4-0-1. But it counts. So congratulations. Oh, nice. So they won four games and drew one. And that was with Invasion Fleet, which had a solid, straight down the middle, 50% win rate. So Tyranids did have two players that went the distance. That went 4-0. And one of those players managed to win an event, even though he didn't win every game. So it's kind of like, 
We've got uh, things like Synaptic Nexus popping up. We, we, I keep seeing people take Synaptic Nexus because it gets them Armor of Contempt, which is definitely something to be aware of. Bangor Onslaught. Uh, Bangor Onslaught is a, is a solid 40% attachment because there'll be you'll play a couple of games where you come across people who haven't encountered you before. Kind of the G GSC effect. Your first time you face Bangor Onslaught, you're so bamboozled, you forget what's going on, you forget your own mother's name, and you end up crying in the corner, dribbling out of one ear. But then after that, you're like, oh, they don't kill anything, and you just drive forward and blast them off the table. The Vanguard Onslaught is tricksy, but once you've played it once, you get the measure of it. So that's it. Nexus of his up and coming because of I'm a Contempt. Uh, Crusher Stampede, this is an anomalous result. This is a weird one as well. This guy, one guy played it, and he won two out of three games. Remicon effects, unless he dropped. Good point. He could have dropped. Won his first two games, lost his third game, didn't play on, and got dropped from the event, but that meant that it didn't count his last two games losses. Yeah. No, so Crush Stampede, I think that's what happened. So I don't think he went two and three. I think he went two and five. It an ending swarm seems to pop up pop up now and again. Have and every time it pops up, it has wildly different results. Um, sometimes it pops up in a week and smashes it. And sometimes it pops up in a week and no one wins a game with it. So I would put Tyranids as a mid-tier faction. You'll win your local RT. You can win a local RTT with them. You can win a local GT with them. But I think the moment you start getting above 50 players, and that's being generous, I think the Tyranids start to struggle. You're gonna have to push fucking hard to go three and two or higher, real fucking hard. For the every man on the street, for the every gaunt in the bio pool, right? Moving up, we have Death Guard, my second favorite faction right now in competitive 4K. I fucking love my Death Guard, man. A very solid faction. Uh, I am not I am not surprised to see player numbers like this. Um, 50, 22 players makes them one of the most played factions. In fact, I think it makes them joint second. That makes them as popular as Custodies. Now, that's probably just like a one-off. But Death Guard always pull in very, very respectful player numbers. And I think there's a good reason for that. A Marine-like faction that doesn't require you to have loads of tanks and doesn't require you to have loads of infantry. They're a marine-like faction, which take quite a hybrid-style army, have a little bit of everything, and uh, so they're not—they're not super cheap, but they're not—they're not—they're not super expensive. Basically, you're not having to go out there and buy like six any six of the same fucking like Anso or Gladiator, whatever it is. Um, no, a little bit, little bit, of, and they've got multiple viable builds. So good variety, and whichever variety of Death Guard you like will do well. So yeah, it, they're a fun faction, and it's nice that the, the Death Guard are actually in a similar sort of position to Guard, where you can go to a tournament if you know what you're doing. You'll go th if just the every man on the there are three and two faction for the every pox walker in the in the graveyard, and for the good players they are a four and one if not higher faction. The Death Guard are in a really fun place right now, uh, lots of variety. Zero pressure. If you want to turn the salt, if you want to turn the, the switch on and go competitive, you can. But there's no need to if you don't want to. You can turn up and just play games and have a good time. I like them. Yeah, I really want to get mine out on the tabletop again. Um, maybe we'll take them to a, a, a tournament. And I won't be taking a tournament in April. Maybe after April. Let's see. I could sit here wanking you off all night, and frankly, you've earned it. Coming in 10th this week are Necrons. Firstly, they're consistently pulling down the numbers. So 35 players means that this week they made up 10% of the player base single-handedly. And they got just raw win rate. They got 97 wins. And they were the most successful faction by, by one metric. Well, by two metrics. Firstly, the number of players. And secondly, by the number of players that went Four and one or better. Now they had a 49% win rate. Uh, the reason they had a 49% win rate is they had a couple of things that were uh, dragging them down. If you look, there was one one ran Annihilation Legion, 
and went 0 and 5. He got the big 0%. <sighs> Respect to this guy for trying it. Clearly, it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, we then had uh, the Awakened Dynasty. Now, speaking of Hive Crypt Legion, uh, very popular. 19 players, 46 wins out of 108 games. Three people going the distance, 43% win rate. Now, you might look at that 43% win rate and think, oh, it's dog shit. Look at this number. This number, uh, re it, 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 more people went the distance with Hypercrypt than any other dynasty. And the thing is, more people went the distance with Hypercrypt than some entire factions. Bear that in mind. The problem with Hypercrypt Legion is have, it's suffering from Space Marine Syndrome. Where a lot of people are hearing Necrons are good, a lot of people are hearing Hypercrypt Legion are good, and so they're jumping on Hypercrypt Legion, and they're losing games. Because it's it's good, but it still requires practice. Necrons aren't Eldar, you still actually have to fucking know what you're doing. So Hybrid Legion is suffering from Space Marine, where it's where all the new blood is going in there. So it's it is do not be fooled by 43% win rate. It is the best one. You're just getting a lot of people learning the ropes. Do not dismiss this. It is consistently performing. Be aware of this. When the inevitable Hybrid Legion nerf comes, and it will come, and I don't think it'll be in. It may come in the form of points increases, but I suspect what GW will do if we, if their measured approach doesn't to go by, is they will, um, they'll, they'll do probably some points changes on Catan, and then change how this works a little bit. People will then pivot, and the natural place they're going to pivot to is Canoptech Court. Be aware of it; it's already very good. Know what it can do. Know how to counter it. This is the one with the power grid. Know your primary game and be aware that this is relevant now and is very likely to get more relevant. Necrons are very, very solid. Um, it's going to take, I reckon, more than one pass at them to sort them out. So there's going to be multiple pathways that they're going to turn to before they end up in the same position as the Eldar, where there are three and two. Surprising, Necrons didn't win uh, many tournaments this week, but uh, that may be a reflection that people are starting to handle them. First time I faced Catan spam, it pushed my shit in. The second time I faced Catan spam, I played around it and was able to beat it on points. The third time I played Catan spam, I killed two of them in one turn. Catan spam is good. In fact, the third time I played them, I killed two Catan in one turn, and then I killed a Catan and Wraiths in the next turn, essentially. Catan are very good, but they ain't invincible. We may be seeing the meta adapt. We may be seeing a, a, just a, a quiet week for the Necrons. Then we've got Sisters. Oh, baby. Sisters are like... The yin to the necron yang. As the necrons do well, the sisters do well. Sisters are seeing some very healthy player numbers with 42 wins out of 84 games, one person going distance and in fact winning a fucking event. Well done. Well done, sisters. Very strong result. 50% win rate on the nose. There are a number of factors that are allowing them to do this. They play very well into necrons. Catan don't like Melter, because how Melter works is once you've rolled the, uh, if you're in Melter range, the Catan, you roll your dice, let's say you roll your dice and you get like a, a four, the Catan half that, and then you add the melt damage on. So if you are, let's say you roll a four uh, on the Melter, on the, uh, on the dice, if it was you have four plus two, and then the Catan half it, it would become three. That's not what happens. Four gets halved into two, then you add the Melter on, so it becomes four. So you're consistently doing that extra pip of damage. It's an extra five up they've got to pass. So firstly, they've got Melter. Melter right now is very relevant. It's very anti-meta into Catan spam, which you are guaranteed to face at least once every turn. Secondly, they basically have Miracle Dice. Well, they have Miracle Dice. They basically have Fate Dice. Sisters are a faction which are like a snowball. 
as the game goes on, they're going to start hitting you harder and harder. And the way you have to beat sisters is you have to kind of kind of have to twat them in the first two turns. But the sisters player is clever. Plays at KG. Build, you know, feed you a few units to get some objectives. Get themselves some miracle dice. And uh, they've got a few ways of, of, of just generating miracle dice each turn. I like having sisters on like an objective. Then what you'll find is, unlike the... Eldar, who at the beginning of 10th would basically mag dump all of their fate dice into you in like one turn, maybe two turns. The sisters do the opposite. They husband those fate dice, they build a nice amount of them up, uh, and then they mag dump all the miracle dice into you over the final three turns. Long story short, to put this in terms that guard players would understand, Imagine if your entire army had Grim Demeanor. Chaos Demons, same shit, different week. Day in, day out. We have the same, week in, week out, we see the same shit from Demon players. 10, you know, all right numbers, not great, not terrible, very middling. A really respectable win rate. Just, just no tournament wins. They've got to get one soon. They are a 4-1 and one faction through and through. Right now, the way demons are playing is Monster Mash. That's the way they're playing. And, and, and that's all, all, I've, all I've seen from demon players from 9th and now into 10th is Monster Mash. I see that it's, 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 still, it's still Index Bellacore. Maybe I'm wrong. It seems like it's still Index Bellacore. And uh, we're seeing a lot of great, we're seeing a lot of great unclean ones here in the field. Uh, because of the fact you can double stack their auras, makes them uh, nice. And the fact that you can pair the, the great unclean ones up with Bellacore, so um, they don't just get shot off the table as they slowly waddle across the board, or they can deep strike in in his uh, Shadow of the Warp and everything. It obviously works, because they are consistently getting that 50%. Or near, you know, up and down, up and down five. I wonder if there's a little bit of orkiness here. I wonder if there's a little bit of Chaos Space Marine here. They've got the trick. Everyone's doing the trick, but no one's trying anything else. What the fuck would happen if you ran? How hoardy can you get? I don't know. I, I don't, maybe, maybe, like I said, could be a really bad take. Anyone watch this now, let me know. Anyone watch this in, in the short and meta watch afterwards, put it down in the comment section. Why are we only seeing Monster Mash? It, it, it works, but you're not, you're getting, you know, you're getting like a bronze medal every time. But you're not getting a gold medal. Tau, Blech. moving on. The, the codex is going to change everything. Technically, it's already out, but the DA1 was out for what, a month before it became officially usable. Oh, so it is out. It is out. All right, the, I'm waiting for the FAQ. It's hard to, to really say anything about this because it's all, it's going to change. Tau right now are very... They, they are Xenos Guard. Uh, they get a lot of stuff. They're very cheap. They're very undercosted. Uh, and essentially, that is allowing them to uh, get some very, very good results. Because it's kind of like... Um, if, you, if, you pl if you're if you playing Marines with your Iron Storm, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to roll out, I'm going to pick up two tanks. It's like, sweet. So they're very, very... They're very, very cheap. Um... I, some would say undercosted. Uh, some would argue against that, uh, but they have a lot of redundancy built in, and they play very similarly to guard uh, in many ways, where they primarily are going to shoot the shit out of you, um, and they're primarily going to have more stuff than you. If Tower had played like this since fucking third edition, I think they would be a much more beloved and endearing faction. But as as it is, they've still got about twenty fucking years of bullshit to make up for. It's a shame. Because I wonder if the codex... Well, it's not a shame. It'll be interesting to see how the codex changes it. By instinct upon seeing the uh, the Tau, like, Farsight detachment, for lack of a better turn, uh, term, made me think, oh, well, it's just going to go toxic as fuck again, isn't it? Because there's going to be battle suits jumping all over the place. But then the battle suits seem kind of wank. They really don't have much damage output. It's got of like... It's got of like... Is it four of the... Four of them with like eight melt gun shots. I'm really not that. Eight shots really isn't a huge amount. 
or the plasma ones is like the most you can get like a bunch of fucking missile shots which aren't going to do great into tanks i don't know how ta where tower are going to lean i haven't faced them yet i haven't looked at the codex enough yet um we're kind of seeing the the twilight of the of the old tau index and we're just waiting to see for that we're waiting to see those new tournament uh, the, the, that new codex uh spin up on the tournament i'm not sure we'll see crisis spam i'm not sure we'll see crew a lot crew are very very good but it seems like you have to go down the crew the full crew route i feel like that my impression is they're trash uh until you take them to the crew attachment and then they're good I mean, bear in mind, we're only theory crafting here, guys. Like, this, could, this could all be very, very wrong. But if the battle suits are mostly out, and the crew, you either have to go, you have to go full in on the crew for them to be good, and maybe a lot of Tau players wouldn't do that. What does the Tau army look like? It looks like fucking infantry and fucking tanks. So maybe the Tau right now seem like a bit like the Xenos Guard. Maybe they're going to go really xenos guard lots of t lots and lots of tanks lots and lots of infantry not saying like spamming infantry but maybe like mechanized infantry and stuff like that uh if they did go down that route i think they would be quite um for the first time in a long time i think they would be quite interesting especially from a guard perspective uh blood angels quite quick uh same shit different week but uh cool Oh shit, different week. So, uh, 11 players. Okay, numbers. Not great, not terrible. 31 wins out of 59 games. One person going the distance, but not winning a tournament. 53% win rate. Pretty much all of that coming from the Sons of Sanguinius. We had a couple of people with Gladius Task Force. Went 50%. A couple of people with Iron Sword Spearhead going 50%. So, fine. You know, generally, nothing to go home about. But it, it, it's, it's great to see... Blood Angels playing like Blood Angels. No one wanted to see. No one wanted to see Red Space Marines with fucking Gladiator Lancers. No one wanted to see that. Blood Angel players didn't like it. That's why, even though you saw it doing so well, a lot you didn't. Even though you always saw Ironstorm Spearhead do well for Blood Angels, you never had the most number, or it rarely had the most players. But, they, but Sons of Sanguinius, it's just, it just feels right. The Blood Angels are healing. They're running at people. They're chopping them up. It's great. I keep seeing Death Company in lists. Good. The reason why Sons of Sanguinius is doing well is because now Blood Angels get plus two strength on the charge. And plus two strength is not quite as powerful as plus one to wound. But it's almost like pseudo plus one to wound. Plus two strength means that you wound toughness three on twos. Plus two strength means you can wound anything, even with chain swords, uh, up to toughness eleven on fives. That's allowing, um, and then when you start getting to like your thunder hammers and stuff, you can you know, you're wounding things on even the toughest things on fives with that. So the Sanguinius is allowing Blood Angels to play like Blood Angels. Well done, GW. You got it right. Same thing as last week, but it's still good to recognize it and praise it. We can say the same about Space Wolves players. Uh, are, are decent they've come at 50 so there's a little bit more space balls here player numbers are good the raw win rate is quite good uh their win rate percentage is 55 percent uh they got one player going the distance but no tournament wins um a little bit you know some of the stats are a little skewed here you had one person do well with the iron storm spearhead so that's pumped up a little bit but then you had one person with vanguard spearhead who, do sh who did shit and they're like that went down a little bit. It seems like Iron Storm is good no matter what kind of uh, Space Wolf you are, what kind of Marine you are. Uh, and it seems like um, Firestorm and Gladius are also pretty safe bets no matter what kind of Space Wolf you are. I'm going to go out and say it. Stormlands is a problem. It's not good for most of the players, most of the chapters. Stormlands is a problem. Every week, it's the most played. And it has the best win rate. And every week it seems to be getting a high win rate as well. It's not that it's winning tournaments. Because it's not. But it's bullying people. The, t the people, are people are calling the Stormlands Wolf Jail. Because they take all the Thunderwolves and they just corral you into the 
into your deployment zone. And by the time you've chewed your way out, they've won on points. So Stormlands is good. Wolf Jail is very powerful, but it's teetering. My instinct is it's teetering on the edge of being a little oppressive and a little unfun to play against. If you're a Space Wolf player, expect this to be under scrutiny right now by the balance team. Do not be surprised if the space, if, if the, the detachment stays the same, but the points start going up. Big question is, where does Space Wolves pivot if that goes down or if the Thunder Wolf goes down? If they, do they just pivot into other things that benefit from Stormlands? Or do they pivot to an entirely different thing like Iron Storm's Beard? Custodies! Um, we've spoken a lot about Custodies recently. Really strong faction. Uh, potentially really strong. I think Custodies are in contention with Necrons for being the new top faction. I think everyone thought it was Necrons, but Custodies keep doing well. 67 wins out of 120 games, 56% win rate with Four players going four and one and better, and one person winning a tournament. And that tournament was uh, a small tournament, 23 players, but still winning a tournament. Space Wolves might be a problem. I'm sad to say Custodies are a problem. How they, we've talked about this last week, how they work is they march into the middle of the board and uh, they sit there on fixed objectives, and you can't, the only way you beat. It's very unfun. It's very uninteractive. And it feels like we're playing 9th edition again. Which is bad because 9th edition was really, really shitty and boring by the end of it. The problem with Custodies is, is, is how unfun they are to play against. It's frustrating. And the only way that I know as a guard player to beat Custodies is for me to use my least fun tactic against them. Which is artillery spam. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that, you know. Like I want to, I want to take, like my mech guard and my infantry guard, and I want, I want to be doing that kind of stuff. If custodies keep this up, you are going to find more and more factions are like, fuck it. If you guys are going to play like dicks, then we're going to play like dicks. So their their tactics are very powerful. My ex my concern here is what they might do to the meta from an attitude point of view. Because if the only way to beat them, if they've got an unbelievably unfun playstyle, so Custodes, if I was the balance team right now, I would be keeping a fucking BDI on these guys. Real BDI. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, custodies are really cheap and they're really popular so when custodies are a problem it's a high priority issue because the moment that custodies become a problem they become a problem for everyone because anyone can pick a competitive custodies army up for basically about 300 quid which in this game is cheap and they can have them painted and in the scene in a weekend so if this is and this is what I'm worried is going to happen. If people are like, well, I just want to, I want to fucking win games, and I want to be able to go to tournament and go four and one. So fuck it, they just, they just basically buy an army and paint it in a weekend and just start smashing it. That's a very, very quickly like the rage virus. It's going to start spreading. Coming in third place to absolutely no one's surprise, we have the Black Templars now. Black Templars getting Black Templars are just they are the best chapter right now. Well, they're not really a chapter, but they're the best base faction right now. They consistently place well. Sometimes Blood Angels do better some weeks than others. Sometimes Space Wolves do better than other weeks. Um, but the one Space Wing chapter that does well every single week is the Black Templars. And they're pulling those numbers down. Um, now, there's a, there is a little bit of a skew here. They only had nine players this week. And one of those players did go five out of six games. And so he was the player that went you know, went the distance. One of the players that went the distance. 
Uh, we didn't quite win the tournament though. So we have we do have one player that went 83%, which kind of pumped the numbers up. But bear in mind that the other that four people went Gladius Task Force and they got a 52% win rate. And four people went right to Crusaders and they got a 55% win rate and someone went the distance. They've not actually been massively skewed out of proportion. This one dude hasn't completely like turbo fucked the results. Black Templars are doing really, really well. That just every week. In and out. Now, Iron Storm Spearhead works very well with Black Templars because of the fact they get uh, basically like five points, uh, five point multi mount, multi mounts as Cathartic Chaser uh, points out. Iron Storm Spearhead boosts vehicles, and Black Templars, not every vehicle, but the vast, vast majority of their vehicles can take like a free, well, free, a five point, more, five or so point multi mount upgrade. And it just gives you, it, you know, it just boosts those vehicles. And just gives you another weapon that you might want a cheeky reroll on uh, from the Iron Storm. So yeah, it's it's just great. If you've got a, you know if a Gladiator Lancer is powerful, then a Gladiator Lancer with a multi mount on it is even better. But you can start playing around with things like transports. So having uh, like an Impulsor uh, isn't a totally stupid idea because that Impulsor has a multi mount on it. Nice. In a meta of vehicles, having an attachment that makes vehicles better is good. Having all of your vehicles be a little bit better than your fellow Marines' vehicles means you benefit from it a lot as well. So really, so yeah, Iron Storm is a bit of an own-brainer. I think we've seen a few weeks now where the Gladius Task Force popped up. And I have to admit, I've been a little dismissive of it, being like, oh, Gladius, bleh. But actually, the Gladius Task Force seems to be doing really, really well for the Black Templars. And I, consistently, it's there. And I think it's just a damn flexible detachment. You see the Gladius cropping up with all the different Marines. Some factions do better with it than others, but it seems to be just consistently doing good. Now, I suspect the Gladius attachment is 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 the one that gives... It's got good stratagems. It's got okay stratagems. Um, I suspect the um, big thing... Is, I, think it, this, I think it gets Armour of Contempt, I think. But um, I suspect the uh, it's just... It's the tactical doctrines. There's always going to be a turn when one of those doctrines is going to be really, really nice. I think Gladius is just a nice... It's a bit like Invasion Fleet for Tyranids. It's a nice take all comers. Now, Rydra's Crusaders we see every week. I don't know exactly uh, what's going in a lot of... Right I see a lot of Black Templars taking Rydra's Crusaders on their normal armies. Uh, we've talked about this before about being kind of like an entrenched mindset like black Templar players they don't give a fuck what's good or bad they've kind of got like that, that sort of guard player mentality or well, like not a similar player mentality to the guard players and sometimes you find like orc players like i don't give a fuck what's good or bad this is the detachment for the black templars i'm a black Templar player so you find people that are playing black templars take these ones black Templar players take this one but it's a good detachment can't go wrong with an armor wide six up feel no pain if you want it can't go wrong with uh, is it Sickle Field of Pain or is it um, Sustained Hits? Lethal Hits. Oh, I'm facing a Horde. Sustained Hits. Oh, I'm facing um, Vehicles. Lethal Hits. It's kind of like the Tyranid thing, you know, the Invasion Fleet. Oh, I'm facing Psychers. I'm facing Grey Knights. I guess I'll fucking pick the anti psycho one. So it's very, 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 very flexible. I also suspect that there is a bit of Black Tide in here as well. Black Templar Tide. Rise Crusaders is very uh, good on pretty much any Black Templar army. Um, but I feel like at least one of these players is probably running. But I feel like one person each week is running a, a Black Tide in some variety. So overall, Black Templars, I would not say that Black Templars are oppressive. They are a solid, consistent 4 and one faction in the right hands. They're A-tier. They're a they're A-tier. I don't think they're S-tier. That's my take. Bit of a big win for Grey Knights this week. Uh, but you do find Grey Knights do well on quieter weekends. And it was a quiet weekend. Only 300 odd players this time compared to 900 odd last, last week. So 18 players, really, really healthy numbers. So it seems like the Grey Knight community came out in some force. Uh, they're a little bit like custodians in the point that you know, they're quite easy to paint. and You don't need many of them. Uh, the big thing behind Grey Knights is resurgence and them doing so well uh recently is their um uh, dread knights are good now uh now they've got dread knights dread knights aren't that durable like you can kill them you know, how many forks can you make kind of thing 
but um, they actually have some half decent punch. They're not trying to wound everything in the fucking game on like sixes, okay? So, um, and they can do that punch at range, not desperately trying to charge out a deep strike and stuff like that. So, Grey Knights now have some punch, a little bit of punch, and that complement, and, but they're still just as good at scoring as always. I'm really, um, now, one thing I would mention is it was a quiet week, and you do tend to find that Grey Knights do well on quiet weeks, because you tend to find on quiet weeks, it's a little bit, some, not always, but sometimes it's a bit of a chance for some of the more local metas to influence the scene. Sometimes you get more, uh, sometimes you get less experienced players, more of the less experienced players. I don't want to shit on anyone, but sometimes you do, and there was a Super Major this week, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not, this it isn't 100% correct. Um, but Grey Knights, when you've got quite high player numbers like that, it indicates that there's, you know, the experienced player still turned up this week. Um, and Grey Knights are an army that if you don't haven't played against before, you don't know what to what they do, they'll beat you. They, a little bit like the Gene Stealer Court effect. They beat you on the first time you face and they bamboozle you, and then after that you kind of get the measure of. Speaking of Gene Stealer Cults, technically they're top this week. I would say Grey Knights are really top this week. But technically, Gene Stiller Cult are top this week. Not to, sh not to shit on the Day of Ascension, uh, but there was only two people. Now, those two people did very, very well. They went nine games won out of 11 games played. And both of those players went X and won. They had an 82% win rate. I guess the big question is, why don't GSC? It would be easy to dismiss this, but there is a bigger question here. Why don't GSC have higher player numbers? Because we are seeing them fluctuate. And we are seeing them get results here and there. Uh, you know, going 5-1 and one at a Super Major is a big deal. Even if you, ha even if you had good matchups, it's a big deal. It meant that you beat five of the players. GSC are a passion army. So I actually know a weirdly high amount of players that have a GSC army. I have a GSC army and I only use it about once every edition. Never add anything to it. I bought it all. Well, the few armies, this was before the GW price increases. They were the, they are the only time I've ever bought an army entirely new in box from GW. First time they came out with the first wave, I bought half my army. And then when they got their second wave drop, I bought the other half my army. And I've never added anything to them since. That was an eighth edition, a long time ago. And yet, and so what I find is a lot of people have Gene Stiller Cult armies and they're hobby players and they're passion players. And so when their army feels good and works well, they play them. And um, but when the army isn't very good, they just they just play something else. Because they're not they're, they they got into the army more for the hobbying side of it than the playing side of it and my evidence for this outside of my own anecdotal evidence looking at the data is gsc no matter how powerful they are never get ridiculous player numbers at the end of beginning of 10th edition gsc were up there for being one of the most powerful factions and yet you know they they were often described as the true rival to the elder and yet they never, ever, ever, ever got anywhere near the same player numbers as the Eldar did. That's my theory, and I have presented some evidence for it. And that is generally, that is the overall summary of this week's meta. Um, main takeaway for me is just how, uh, how in flux... How in flux the meta is right now. Um, every week, something new is at the top. And even if it doesn't stay at the top, something new at the top. Uh, we're also seeing... Um, but there's, some factions are settling into a groove. And some factions uh, are, seem to be dead but have a few twitches of life. And some factions are very much in the ascendancy. Uh, if I was to say the three factions that I think are deadest, Admech, Deathwatch, GSC. I know GSC are top right now, but it's more in terms of like looking at player numbers. Um, if we look at the factions that seem to have settled the most, we're looking at um, 
I would say factions like uh, like Eldar, definitely settled. Um, and if you're looking at what, what else? Eldar, Marines and Orcs seem to have settled. Um, and then you've got uh, factions which are uh, top right now. I would say Custodes and uh, Custodes and Necrons. Um, and if, if I was to pick a third one that's somewhat in the ascendant, uh, somewhat top, or, or Black Templars. Black Templars consistently do very well. Factions in the Ascendancy, I would pick um, Guard, Sisters, and Custodies. Very much in the Ascendancy right now. Everyone else is kind of bouncing around a little bit. And on that note, we're going to wrap today's stream up. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And of course, as always... See you guys next time. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Wolf, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time. <laughs>